Dublin, Ireland, 1798. The revolt was over. British forces crushed it in months. But Cornwallis was unsatisfied. The rebels' original plan could have easily succeeded had England not caught a lucky break, and without major reform, Ireland would remain a powder keg. The old personal union linking the British Isles was no longer adequate. The crown needed a truly united kingdom. Hello, welcome back to Secondhand History. Last time, Cornwallis wrapped up his term as Governor General of India shortly after defeating one of the British East India Company's biggest regional enemies, the Kingdom of Mysore. With the company on firmer civil and military footing, he set sail for England in early 1793 and arrived home to find Europe in turmoil. Remember how France got involved in the American Revolution? Well, turned out that some of its soldiers liked what they saw over there and hoped it could inspire chains back home. However, they soon learned that not only was France's royal court uninterested in fundamental reform, but that the monarchy had also bankrupted itself. Combine that with failed harvests and a very unpopular queen, and by 1789 you had, well, the French Revolution. Europe's other monarchs banded together to stop this nonsense, the French ignored their demands, and all-out war engulfed the continent. In this tumultuous setting, Cornwallis mostly sat on the sidelines. The guy was getting old. He attended dinner parties lauding his success in India, took part in an unsuccessful diplomatic mission to coordinate the anti-French coalition, and finally wound up at the Royal Ordnance, procuring and distributing weapons. Then in 1798, he received a new assignment. A major revolt had broken out in Ireland. London lacked confidence in the previous general it sent, and wanted Cornwallis's help to put down the rebellion. Conquered by England centuries ago, Ireland was officially a separate kingdom that shared the same monarch as Britain, a situation known as a personal union. In practice, Ireland was Britain's de facto colony. Ireland had a parliament, but it couldn't even pass its own laws. Then in 1782, mere months after the Battle of Yorktown, Irish self-rule advocates demanded legislative autonomy, and Britain caved. The last thing London wanted was a repeat of what just happened in America. However, after some initial progress in Ireland's newly empowered parliament, reformist policies stalled amid opposition from the island's traditional pro-British elite. Of particular note were issues surrounding Irish Catholics. In Ireland, political power lay with the island's Anglican Protestant minority, while Irish Catholics, the majority of the population, had limited rights. They couldn't vote until 1793, and even then, they couldn't sit in Parliament. Frustration spread, Irish nationalists radicalized, and an organization called the Society of United Irishmen hatched a plot with revolutionary France to overthrow the government and establish an independent Irish Republic. A large French invasion force would land in Ireland, and the United Irishmen would rise on their signal, together driving the British out once and for all. It wasn't necessarily a bad plan. The British Navy aside, the Irish coast was only lightly defended. The French set sail in December of 1796 and successfully reached Ireland mostly in one piece. But right before they could land, a storm scattered the fleet. British authorities realized that something was seriously amiss and launched a heavy-handed crackdown that crippled the United Irishmen's leadership. But it also further alienated the population. In May of 1798, a mixture of Catholics and some anti-British Protestants rose in revolt, French or no French. By the time Cornwallis reached Ireland in late June, government forces had managed to defeat the main rebel army. Even compared to the American revolutionaries Cornwallis fought years earlier, the Irish rebels were sorely outclassed. Most didn't even have guns, and instead fought with homemade pikes. However, guerrilla forces still stalked the Irish countryside. Taking control, Cornwallis brought in additional reinforcements to slowly root them out, but he tried to avoid heavy-handed tactics that he felt might plant the seeds for future unrest. Instead, he promised amnesty to low-level rebels who laid down their arms, and personally commuted the sentences of hundreds of convicted rebels who otherwise would have been hanged. A new threat emerged in August when a small French force finally landed and rallied enough men to rout the British garrison at Castlebar, but Cornwallis caught and crushed them before they could cause any more trouble. 
By autumn, the rebellion was all but over. Putting down the revolt was the easy part. The real challenge would be winning the peace. The fighting had devastated the Irish countryside, and had the first invasion fleet landed, the outcome might have been very different. Cornwallis identified anti-Catholic legislation as a key source of discontent and felt that until Irish Catholics gained full political rights, future revolts were inevitable. However, allowing Catholics to sit in the Irish Parliament was not only controversial for religious reasons, but widely seen as politically dangerous. Many Protestants feared that a Catholic-majority Irish Parliament would back Britain's enemies. The solution? Officially merged the kingdoms of Great Britain and Ireland through a formal Act of Union. Because they would share one Parliament, Irish Catholics could be allowed to run for office without ever risking them forming a parliamentary majority, theoretically securing Ireland's loyalty on both fronts. Enacting such a major reform was no simple matter, but Cornwallis's plan had a key backer in London, British Prime Minister William Pitt. To pass their plan, they would first need to push the Act of Union through both the British and Irish parliaments, and then follow up with the second bill for Catholic Emancipation, as it was known, in the new Unified Parliament. Passing the Act of Union in London would be straightforward enough. It was not an entirely new idea, and the rebellion had jolted some of its skeptics to reconsider. The bigger challenge lay in Ireland. Because Ireland's population was half that of Great Britain's at the time, a united parliament would inevitably mean fewer net seats for Ireland, and the current Irish MPs weren't too happy about this. So, after a botched first attempt at passage, Pitt and Cornwallis turned to bribery. Well, technically official patronage or quote-unquote compensation, but basically, yeah, bribery. They also leveraged the promise of Catholic emancipation to provide popular pressure. Catholics couldn't hold office, but if they met their property requirements, they could vote, after all. After enough arm-twisting, cajoling, and various forms of pressure, Cornwallis and Pitt finally pushed the Act of Union through both the British and Irish Parliament in 1800. Great Britain and Ireland became the United Kingdom, their parliaments merged, and Catholics would soon gain the right to- Wait, never mind. King George III was having none of this Catholic emancipation business. Even though he couldn't directly control Parliament, his ward held immense sway, and he was far from alone in his opinion. The Act of Union passed, but Catholic emancipation died. Knowing that they had promised Catholic emancipation to Irish voters, Pitt and Cornwallis did what they saw as the only honorable thing, and politely resigned. The final years of Cornwallis's life were less than remarkable. He negotiated a short-lived peace with Napoleon, returned to India to serve a second term as Governor General, and promptly died there in 1805. Over his lifetime, Cornwallis had witnessed, and helped facilitate, a massive transition in the British Empire. Before 1776, colonial America formed the center of Britain's overseas empire, and the loss of the 13 colonies after Cornwallis' surrender at Yorktown left many wondering if the empire would survive. But his subsequent success in India laid the path for the British Empire's eventual resurgence. India would become the empire's new crown jewel. Ireland would remain a troubled region, but even so, it would be a century before another large-scale revolt occurred. All the while, despite being the British Empire's point person on three continents, by most accounts Cornwallis himself was, for his time, a relatively reasonable guy, and even at times sympathetic to the Empire's non-British subjects. Yet he never wavered in his belief in Britain's right to rule. In time, this idea of benign superiority would come to shape Britain's self-image. From his military career to his personal attitudes, Few men better embody this pivotal moment in the British Empire's history than Charles. Okay, please stop. Err, what now? Two issues. First, you know I'm still mad at you for using the modern version of Westminster Palace in the first video. Fine. Guilty as charged. Second, and more importantly, where is your bibliography? You know, the big list of sources you used? Oh, that. I'll try to recall those from memory? Really now? No bibliography, and that's your attitude? Look, most history videos here don't even have one. That doesn't make it okay. 
Without a bibliography, viewers have no way of knowing where you got your facts or gauging their reliability. You might have made them up or plagiarized someone for all they know. Citing your sources is critical for any work in history, and without a bibliography, in an academic setting, your work is almost completely... Thank you for watching today's video. Please like and subscribe, and hope to see you next time.